such type of webinars online which we never thought earlier otherwise to have distinguished speakers like dr dr ak singh to have amongst us in a in an offline seminar would have been very very difficult because of their very busy schedule and at the beginning i i am very we are very thankful to dr ak singh and the other speakers who will be joining uh, in this series this 2020 is the 58th year of the department of plant breeding and genetics of assam agriculture university jorhat so it is a golden jubilee for the department and we are thinking of and organizing a modest function maybe later in the year when the situation improves i will not take much time i welcome our vice honorable vice chancellor in charge dr ashok bhattacharya in spite of his busy schedule because he has to run the director of directorate of research which itself is a big office and in addition to that he also is handling the responsibilities of the vice chancellor so thank you sir for joining us and welcome you i welcome dr jayant deka dean faculty of agriculture who has been very encouraging us and also very supportive uh, for organizing this type of webinars and other functions and i welcome all the statutory officers who are participating online and the distinguished members from the audience our faculty members faculty members from other institutes postgraduate students as well as undergraduate students we could not accommodate all these students in this webinar online but links have been given for them for live streaming in both in youtube and the facebook so i again welcome all of you then i uh, yes hand over to dr roman sharma who is the organizing secretary thank you am i audible yeah so good morning to uh, one and all honorable vice chancellor assam agriculture university dr ak singh director iri uh which happens to be my own institution since i did my degree there phd so uh then uh, professor and head department of plant breeding and genetics dr arun sharma all the participants other statutory officers and other participants in the webinar so uh, as mentioned by head of the department plant breeding that lots of seminars are being webinars are being organized now by different uh, organizations and uh, departments but uh, this webinar in my opinion is one of the very important uh, topic is being covered by this webinar because uh, we know that the crop improvement or the plant breeding and genetics is the basic to agriculture uh, unless we get a good variety other other branches of agriculture will not uh, progress or proceed so since the breeding of the new wheat and rice genotypes in 16th indian breeders have made tremendous contribution towards self sufficiency in uh, this country today we have achieved a status of exporting cereals worth 
about uh, of about uh, rupees fifty six thousand eight hundred and forty one crores during two thousand eighteen and nineteen. Again, it's a matter of great pride that during uh, two thousand eighteen nineteen, India exported two point seven zero lakh tons of pulses worth rupees one thousand six hundred and eighty crores. Really, it's a matter of you know. Uh, Joy and pride for the country that from you know importing for pulse importing country now we have now transformed into a pulse exporting country from a food secure nation now we are moving towards a, a goal of nutrition security. So already seventy biofortified uh, crop varieties have been bred in this country with a target of breeding fifty more. Such biofortified crops by 2000 crop varieties by 2025. Again, we have new challenges like breeding climate resilient crop varieties and emerging pest and disease problems are there. So, we have to breed varieties for resistance to this. Then, quality breeding is another important area which is really a challenge for us. Then breeding for organic agriculture. Now the government is putting a lot of emphasis on organic agriculture. We need varieties for organic agriculture. These are the, some of the areas which are propping up as uh, challenges for the crop breeders. It is uh, very heartening that the Department of Plant Breeding and Genetics of our faculty, Faculty of Agriculture and Assam Agriculture University has taken this initiative to organize this webinar on such a uh, such an important topic of crop improvement for food and nutrition security challenges and opportunities which is very timely and befitting i welcome again from my behalf on behalf of the faculty all of you to this webinar and i wish uh, complete success for this webinar thank you all Well, uh, good morning. I extend warm welcome and greetings from Assam Agricultural University and on my personal behalf. Dr. P. K. Bawa has rightly mentioned that what could be a better occasion than an event like this to commemorate the 50th year of existence of the Department of Plant Breeding and Genetics in Assam Agriculture University. And I would like to extend hearty congratulations to the organizers for holding such a very beautiful webinar series where eminent personalities like Dr. A.K. Singh, Namaste Singh sir, how are you? I think doing well. Yeah. Dr. A.K. Singh, then Dr. Kuldeep, probably he will be joining us in the evening. Then Dr. Sasane, our Vidyut Sharma, the National Professor. Then N.P. Singh, Akshay Talukdar, having all their commendable works in their prospective fields. And I think the participants will be immensely benefited from their addresses. Uh, well, all the statutory officers are here, I suppose, and the number of participants, number of participants are really encouraging. And I think especially the students and the researchers will be greatly benefited from this survey series. So as we understand, uh, the sustainable food, food production is one of the major challenges of the 21st century. In the global environmental problem, when you talk about climate change, increasing population, then degradation of natural resources, including soil degradation, 
and of course the biodiversity loss. And many of the species are either extinct or expiricated from the localities where these were grown previously. So traditional agriculture is the result of experiences uh, developed by local farming community through thousands of years. In other words, this practice is as old as our civilization. It is still nursing a sizable population for centuries and continue to feed people in many regions of the world uh, despite pressure from modern way of farming. So a traditional farmer adjusts to environment, environmental changes rather, uh, through their indigenous knowledge and experiences such as changing farming practices and cultivating the adapted crops. Traditional farmers preserve genotypes having unique and valuable traits within their herds and traditional crop varieties that tolerate environmental stresses including climate change. So local knowledge and locally available resources have been utilized by traditional farmers to develop sustainable farming system. Thus, these traditional farming system have lot to offer in a sustainable manner. Crop self-sufficiency, which is crucial to ensure food security, is only possible from local agriculture down through selecting crop varieties and the base method and seasons of growing crops secure a stable food supply. Traditional farming in villages has shown a characteristic of adaptive capacity and become manifested in environmentally friendly practices, self-sufficiency, adaptability to environment and climate change, and links with local culture and importantly to the economy of the particular locality. The importance of local economy for its products and services through local vendors has taught us the importance of local agricultural market and supply chain. Particularly during this pandemic situation, we have learned a lot about all these things very precisely. To exploit a traditional system with land races or other knowledge, we need to top up our approaches. But priorities are sometimes lopsided with borrowed technology, borrowed knowledge, and systems to improve agricultural production and productivity. The policy incentives supportive of agricultural traditional farming practices conducive to biodiversity conservation and agricultural disaster prevent somewhere sometimes you feel it, it is really lacking. Uh, this has been reflected with low level of technology adoption rate by small and marginal farmers particularly due to a probably missing link with their traditional farming. So this particular issue need to be addressed very precisely uh, especially this is another lesson probably during this pandemic situation. This warrants us to focus uh, local agricultural knowledge, skill and systems in the context of supporting Indian economy at grassroots level as a step forward towards self-reliance. Aiming to implement the Honorable Prime Minister vision, vocal for local with global outreach, under Atmanirbhar Bharat Abhijan. Paradigm changing reforms in the agricultural research and extension fund is needed to increase farmers' incomes. 
as you know, by 2022, we need to double the income of farmer. It will strengthen the voice to buy, to promote, and preserve local skills and products in India and work towards vocal for local as an opportunity to boost the local skills and products in India. Many times nowadays we talk about OPOP, one product, one panchayat. That means there is a need to have a research policy or if at all it is there, we need to revisit the research policies, maybe at local level, zonal level, district level, maybe state level or maybe at central level. So this has given us an additional opportunity to make, look into in depth of the crop improvement policies because we need to pick up some of the signature items from different localities, whether it is a zone, or it is a village, or it is a block or whatever. So this angle need to be, you know, tightly linked with the policy, whatever we have, if we want to, if we uh, want at all to revisit the existing policies of government of India. And other approaches could be the exploration of traditional knowledge about resilient properties, such as draw, pace, etc. Then exploration of traditional plant breeding systems, then manipulation of about wild crop relatives. So these are some of the thoughts that I wanted to share with the eminent personalities today. We have, as I mentioned, Dr. Singh, Dr. Kuldeep today, and in following these, four or five other eminent speakers. So I think this is a very right platform to discuss all about, uh, all, all about the crop improvement, considering the uh, potentiality of each and every crop and nutritional security. At the same time, another issue could be what the pandemic situation has taught us is the uh, very focused research on safe life enhancement of different crops, maybe the perishables particularly. So with this, I would like to wish all the best to the organizers and wish this Obanet series a grand success. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sharma, and also thank, thanks to our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. Bhattasarya, for his insightful uh, speech, which will be really, very, very thought provoking in context of this today's webinars. Now, Dr. A.K. Singh needs really no introduction. He is widely known as Basmati rice breeder of India. In fact, he is the leader of Basmati rice variety development in IRI. For more than 25 years, he has been associated and even today, he is very actively associated in the Basmati rice breeding program at IRI. And in the morning, he regularly visits Kill. Maybe today also he might have already visited the field. So this shows his interest with the rice crop, particularly rice basmati rice crop improvement. Well, Dr. A.K. Singh is from Gazipur of Uttar Pradesh. Then he was graduated and he received postgraduate and graduate degree 
from Banaras Hindu University, Balanasi. Then he received his PhD from the institute where he is now living, that is in the Indian Agricultural Research Institute, New Delhi. He has been the recipient of a number of awards. He was recipient of the prestigious ICR Rafi Ahmad Kidwai Award and the ICR Bharat Ratna Dr. C. Subramaniam Award during 2013. He was the IIA Best Teacher Award recipient of Best Teacher Award in 2002, then IRI Dr. D.P. Paul Award 2007, ICR Special Recognition Certificate in 2009, Agricultural Leadership Award 2011, the prestigious Borog Award 2012, Dr. A.S. Shima Award 2012, then Sri Om Prakash Vasin Award 2017. He has developed more than 13 very popular basmati rice varieties using the traditional plant breeding methods as well as combining the modern techniques of molecular assist, marker assisted selection in development of the basmati rice varieties and he has also developed a basmati hybrid rice variety. All these varieties have generated lot of income for the farmers not only in the nation also the nation has been able to earn foreign exchange to the tune of about 25,000 crores of rupees. This is a huge achievement for our eminent speaker today, Dr. A.K. Singh. So, he has been associated in the teaching program before joining as director of IRI this January 2020. He was the head of the department, head of the division of genetics, who led the division for about five years. And at the same time, he was also joint director of research in church. So he, still today, he is also actively associated with the teaching program in the division of genetics. He has guided many students at MSc as well as PhD. And he has more than 120 publications in the national and international referred journals, reputed journals. He has also the fellowships of three national societies, National Academy of Agricultural Sciences, Indian Society of Genetics and Plant Breeding, and Indian National Science Academy. He has been the fellow. So, it is really, really very uh, praiseworthy and we really welcome you, sir, to this webinar and thank you for accepting our invitation and to present this seminar on rice improvement particularly because you are leading not only the nation but also maybe international level or crop improvement particularly in rice which is the major food crop of india as well as other countries i welcome you sir and also i just now invite you to present your webinar thank you sir Thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, overwhelming uh, introduction. I'm uh, really, uh, I feel greatly humbled and uh, 
uh, I am indeed thankful to the university and particularly Dr. Arun Sarma for uh, giving this opportunity to interact with this young group. I would like to uh, thank the Honorable Vice Chancellor Dr. Bhattacharya for uh, you know, inviting me for this inaugural uh, lecture and uh, I compliment him uh, for so uh, eloquently summarizing the vision of Prime Minister for this nation. Uh, he does all the aspects that our Prime Minister is uh, thinking of how to double the farmer's income by 2020, how we should uh, think, uh, you know, globally but act locally. And uh, in that context, uh, we are doing quite a few things together. One of the major projects uh, on utilizing the land race diversity where Assam Agriculture University is a lead uh, partner through DVT program. We are uh, doing that about 15,000 rice land races. Uh, we have already taken transplanting and uh, the university is also participating in the uh, complete phenotyping. I'm also uh, thankful to all the university uh, authorities, the dean, the joint director extension uh, for being here to this seminar. Uh, since this uh, group is joined by more than 1,000 young students, I would like to dwell upon some of the basic, applied, and uh, you know the translational research aspects of what we are doing, with a uh, uh, major focus on our work on rice as the case example. But uh, the principles, fundamental principles, are basically the same, can be applied to any uh, crop. So. Uh, uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, if you permit, now I would like to share my uh, slides and start with the presentation. Uh, can we, can have, we can have, uh, yeah, we can have uh, discussions also uh, after the presentation is over. Uh, I would request the uh, listeners to kindly note down their question uh, one by one, and uh, I would be more than happy to interact with you uh, on those uh, questions that you have. So, uh, I hope my screen is visible to you. And so, uh, the title, which I slightly modified as a decade of plant molecular breeding experience in rice, the plant breeders risk with genomics tool. And how these genomics tools have brought revolution in. Uh, breeding program, not only in rice, uh, many crops, but rice is of course uh, leader. Now, uh, before that, I would like to tell uh, something about this great institute. Uh, I would like to request uh, all the uh, participants to kindly mute their mic so that the background noise uh, disturbance is not there. And uh, this institute, uh, as you know, the foundation stone uh, was uh, laid on 1st April 1905 by Lord Karjan. And uh, this was in the eastern province of India, a place called uh, uh, Pusha in the Banga district, then now it is in Samastipur district. And while laying the foundation stone in 1905, uh, Karjan said that the seed I am planting would soon blossom out, making PUSA the nucleus of agricultural activities, research, and education, which would not only benefit Bihar and Bengal, but the whole of the country and the world attract the best of the talents from India and abroad. Now you see how a person's vision, a person who is really visionary can make this kind of a statement. What was said uh, almost 120 years back, 150 years back, is exactly coming uh, true that IRI has gone uh, global. It is not only a national institute, but uh, getting students from many countries. And then IRI has opened a university in Afghanistan called Anastu. Then IRI has gone to Myanmar and opened an advanced center for agriculture research and education, we call it AFAIR. And uh, we are trying now to have IRI as a global university for agriculture research and education. But this was all imbibed in the vision of this great visionary person, Lord Karjan, 
when the foundation of the stone was uh, laid by him. This is the old uh, Phipps Laboratory, and why it is called Phipps Laboratory is because a philanthropist called Henry Phipps from USA had given 30,000 pounds at that point of time to uh, establish this uh, facility and uh, 1934 there was a massive earthquake because of which the building got devastated. Now we have this building only in pictures and uh, in order to, you know, uh, uh, the, when the, the institute was shifted from uh, Pusa Bihar to IAI New Delhi, uh, the name Pusa came from there. Sometimes people say that the name Pusa came because uh, Henry V had donated 30,000 pounds and P was taken from his name and he represented country USA and that's how the name PUSA to recognize his conclusion came. But that's not quite so because we uh, have uh, verified the land records of the place there and the name Pusa existed in the land records even prior to the institute established in 1905. Uh, the institute played a very pivotal role in bringing green revolutions where the dwarfing uh, genes in wheat now in turn uh, was introduced in the Mexican variety and these Mexican dwarfs were brought in the country. Uh, during 1962, the first uh, material came for testing, 67-68, the 30,000 tons of seeds were brought of uh, three, four varieties. And uh, the wheat production at that point of time in 1960-61 uh, was 12,000 tons. 12, 12 million tons, sorry, 12 million tons. And country was importing about 5 million tons of wheat under PL480 scheme to provide food to the uh, nationals. And uh, with the adoption of these dwarf uh, high-yielding varieties that came from Mexico, in uh, 1972, our production went up to 17 million tons. So why it was called, you know, a big jump because 5 million tons we were importing, but because of the introduction of these varieties, 5 million tons increased happened, and then India uh, stopped in importing wheat under pl 4 scheme. So that's where, you know, uh, this was described as a major achievement. And later in 79, the term Green Revolution uh, was coined by William Gow. And the term Green Revolution, many times when I uh, discuss in person with Dr. Swamiath and I ask him, I still see, uh, find that there, are, there is a disturbance coming, background noise coming. Some people have their light on and it was them to kindly switch it off. All those who are listening, please switch off your mic because disturbance is very prominent and it distracts the uh, attention, no? So, uh, Dr. Swaminathan described why it was called the Green Revolution by William S. Gowd is because uh, it is the plant green color, that is chlorophyll, which has the ability to absorb the sunlight and then through process of photosynthesis convert the solar energy in form of chemical energy uh, to produce carbohydrates. So it is the greenness of plant that really led to capturing of solar energy and the entire increase in carbohydrate production uh, that happened is primarily because of the green color of plants. If the plants did not have green color, this revolution would not have been realized. So that's how the term green revolution was uh, used to describe this phenomenal gain. The varieties became dwarf and they were responsible to uh, application of uh, fertilizers and then it was coupled with, uh, you know, uh, irrigation facility development and many things that Swamnathan calls it as a symphony, symphony between scientists, farmers and policy makers. All three of them, they joined together and to uh, support this cause. But one thing I would like to mention here, which is very important, is that uh, the same quantity of uh, seed was brought on the same seed, which unloaded it first uh, in uh, Gujarat for India and then it went to Pakistan. But Pakistan could not make that difference. The reason being that Pakistan did not have the indigenous capacity in plant breeding. 
in genetics, understanding of science. You see, one thing we must realize that all these varieties imported from Mexico, they were of red color. The party quality was very bad. This variety did not last for long actually. But what happened that our breeders, with all their knowledge in genetics and plant breeding, the legacy of Dr. B. P. Paul, Dr. Swaminathan, Dr. A. B. Yoshi, Dr. S. K. Jain, Dr. B. S. Mahfoud, that they immediately used this dwarfing source in breeding program and developed a large number of Indian wheat varieties with high productivity. And these dwarfs, they lasted just for four years. Uh, by 72, 73, they were out of cultivation and we had our own varieties with excellent grain and cooking quality, umber color, high productivity, and so on. So it happened because we had the human resources available in the country. And that is where it is very important to continue with that effort of developing critical human resource in agriculture, which is the objective of this particular webinar. In spite of all the crisis, people sitting in different places, different corners of the country, in their home, in their villages, they are still able to join together to uh, understand what is happening uh, globally. So these are the two people who played a very important role. Dr. V. P. Pao, who wrote a article in Indian farming in 1930, search for new genes. And today also what we are doing by evaluating these 15,000 land races of rice is that we are searching for new genes. What he said uh, uh, 90 years before. C. Subramaniam, in whose name this uh, Bharat Ratna C. Subramaniam Award for Best Teachers, Award of ICR for Best Teachers given, uh, is instituted. Uh, he was uh, the Minister of Agriculture at that point of time and he was very proactive and supportive, taking the decisions of importing 35,000 tons, 35, tons of wheat in one go was not a small decision. So, uh, but he took and that had its own impact. Then the other people who made it happen was, of course, Norman Bola, primarily responsible for developing dwarf wheat, and Dr. Swaminathan, realizing its importance, bringing it, utilizing it in program, and a series of varieties uh, which uh, uh, helped uh, providing food security to the country. Today, if you see, I am getting distracted with the sound. Can you please switch off? Somebody had not switched off. Please do that. I request all the participants, audience, to please mute their microphones. Please. So uh, that was uh, what, uh, you know, the result is today in the wheat production in a 1920 uh, uh, season was 107 million tons. Imagine from 12 million tons in 1962 to 107 million tons. If you take in terms of research contribution of public sector institutions, including 75 agriculture universities, federal government institutions, and if you take uh, three crops, rice, wheat, Rice total production is 117 million tons, wheat is 107 million tons, that makes 125 million tons. Add 25 million tons of pulses, that makes uh, 250 million tons total. So rice plus wheat plus pulses, 250 million tons of the total 295 million tons. And this 250 million tons is the contribution essentially of public sector research program, which is many times not realized not talked about, but the fact is that the country's food security is there if it is. We have survived three months of lockdown. For another three months, absolutely, we don't see any issue. We have got 73 million tons of food grain in our buffer stock when we entered the lockdown. So that was all possible because of the research that has been done by many of these public sector institutions. The, uh, Increase was like 1.32 times in area only, but production increased 5.7 times. And this was possible because of enhanced productivity uh, in, in, in food grains, all cross put together. Uh, now, 
the conventional plant breeding has played a major significant role in developing crop varieties and uh, you know if you look at the total list of crop varieties more than 3000 varieties have been officially released and notified uh, but now we are faced with a lot of challenges that need to be addressed with cutting edge science and technology the challenges are biotic stresses abiotic stresses grain and cooking quality nutritional quality these are the major issues which have to be addressed and science makes it more efficient and that is where there are several approaches that have been used the one is the approach of molecular breeding where we deploy molecular markers for efficiency improvement of breeding program and other is the uh, transgenic technology including genome editing where you can bring in changes in the gene at at will you see the mutation was a process it was random but today if you see of genome editing genome editing is a process which is targeted mutagenesis so you can mutate a gene at will the gene that you want to mutate and genome editing appears to be a very powerful tool uh, there has been lot of debate in the country whether genome editing should be considered as gm or non gm and uh, a committee was constituted I was also happened to be a member in that and then finally the recommendations have been given that the two aspects of genome editing that is called sdn1 and sdn2 site directed nuclease 1 and site directed nuclease 2 these are the two that would be uh, free from regulation uh, very limited regulations at the institute biosafety committee level will apply and this draft is submitted and hopefully it will be accepted so that will make uh, you know use of these powerful tools uh, for product development much more uh, easier the uh, what we do in case of molecular breeding we identify uh, marker and gene linkages which are tightly linked together and the extreme form of tight linkages can be discovering a marker within gene so that it is not separated by recombination and that is now possible because many genes we know precisely by their sequence locations and within gene single nucleotide polymorphism markers can be developed so uh, this uh, all this you know was possible by using fundamental principles of uh, uh, genetics the uh, if you look at uh, two laws of inheritance Uh, law of segregation and law of independent assortment given by gegger john mendel uh, you uh, uh, in in case of independent assortment you see that uh, there are two factors which are coming from different parents they stay together in the f1 hybrid and during the formation of gametes they are separated from each other without influencing each other and uh, if you go for a test class r f2 populations you should be able to identify based on the recombination distance between two markers between two genes uh, what is the linkage strength between them and that strength is utilized uh, for the purpose of uh, marker assisted uh, breeding generally in order to have effective selection we should have a recombination frequency between marker and gene should be uh, say about 1 uh, cm and that describes a tight linkage but if you have marker within gene it makes the process very very efficient and uh, all this was possible uh, in practice because of some uh, novel discoveries and one of those is uh, polymerase chain reaction by carry mullis you all know about it so i will not go into detail but this technology brought a revolution in plant breeding where he identified certain enzymes uh, uh, called tag polymerase from the hot springs and uh, which uh, are stable being a protein is still stable at a very high temperature and that one him a uh, nobel prize at a very short period of time perhaps from the discovery to award of nobel prize this is one of the minimum gap that went to him uh, the steps involved i'll not go into detail you are most of you know about it three steps of denaturation allylin elongation and then you see the pictures on gel for the parental polymorphism and uh, the several applications that can be used uh, uh, for the pcr you can use it for molecular phylogeny you can use for mapping of genes 
marker assisted selection, disease diagnostics, and GM detection. All these areas, different types of markers which are in use. Uh, they started markers basically as uh, morphological markers, plant users were using earlier. Even today, also in most of the uh, programs, when you go to protect your varieties with the protection of plant varieties and farmers' rights authority, it is the morphological markers. That is DUS, what we call distinctness, uniformity, and stability. And the dust characters are uh, well defined in all the crops. Those are primarily based on morphological features, uh, based on which they are registered. But we can go for biochemical markers also in the isozymes, uh, which refers to protein binding pattern and the molecular. Uh, in fact, uh, I must clarify that. Uh, the molecular should be into two groups. There is little mistake. Molecular can be biochemical, it can be DNA markers. So the biochemicals are also molecules. The proteins are also molecules. So basically, this is also a molecular markers. So molecules can be classified as uh, biochemical and then DNA-based markers. And in DNA-based, you have those based on PCR, those based on hybridization. And among this, again, you have several variants. I will not go into detail because there can be a separate full phase lecture on types of markers and then you will study the phenotype and the genotype segregation of markers versus phenotype and then based on the recombination percentage between markers and genes you identify which marker is linked with the gene and what is its chromosomal location and once that happens to be a tight linkage it can be applied in the breeding program. Now with that little background of how conventional plant breeding is started from use of dwarfing genes from selections initially and then dwarfing genes which was supported by natural mutations then advances in molecular biology to map genes develop markers and having marker state associations the deployment of these markers in the breeding program i am going to talk about some of the uh, you know the uh, case studies using rice and particularly in case of basmati rice what all we have done uh, to uh, put forth before you the the power of this particular technology. If you look at the traditional varieties of basmati rice, they are pretty tall, prone to lodging, photoperiod sensitive, and long duration. They take about 160 days seed to seed maturity, and yield is hardly 2.5 tons per hectare. At IARI, we started basmati breeding program in late 60s when Dr. Swaminathan was. Uh, uh, heading the division of genetics and later he became director of IRI and his idea was that if we can combine the uh, quality of basmati rice, traditional basmati rice into high yielding background that will bring a revolution in production and farmers prosperity and that is what has been achieved now the Pusa basmati one was the first dwarf varieties then 2003 we came out with Pusa basmati 1121 and then improved Pusa Vasmati 1 as first product of molecular breeding from any resistance to bacterial blight and Pusa Vasmati 1509, a variety where you can see the cooked kernel length is almost 1 inch and these farmers are really happy. If you go and visit these farmers in western UP, in Punjab, in Haryana, you will see that at their farm uh, they have all the facilities that you can dream or imagine. And many times they are able to avail, uh, you know, the education for their children, the medical care for their elderly people in best of the best hospital possible because this has provided them so much of uh, kusha. If you look at the development, how long it has taken from 1930 when the first traditional tall variety was officially notified was uh, Basmati 370. And in 1989, we came out with Pusa Basmati 1, 1121 in 2003, and uh, 1509 in 2013. You can look at the increase in kernel length on poking from almost uh, 12 to 13 millimeter in case of Basmati 370 to almost 22 to 25 millimeter in case of 1509. This was possible by selective intermating in segregating generations to bring in the favorable genes which were present in different parents together. We do the same thing today also using markers. We call it as marker assisted recurrent selection. But earlier when we did, we selected for example in left population two plants which were elongating, but the elongation was supposed 15 millimeter in one case, 16 millimeter in other case. 
when we intercast these plants two elongating ones if they were elongating because of different genes then in the progeny there was a possibility to bring more elongation and that's how we proceeded this was all based on phenotypic selection not using any molecular marker system selection but today it is possible because now we know that which quality gene where it is located markers are known and markers can be deployed overall the research carried out led to reduction of duration from 160 days to 125 days in the new varieties and improving productivity from 2 tons per hectare to almost 6 tons per hectare. So for the students who are in plant breeding or agriculture in general, uh, you know, having a seizure-like curve in plant breeding is very difficult. So you increase the duration, you get higher yield. But increasing duration, as reducing duration and then combining with higher yield is a tough challenge, which we have been able to achieve and enhance productivity. In terms of foreign exchange earning, a reference was made. The current foreign exchange earning is almost 33,000 crores. In 1920, 33,000 crores of Basmati rice has been exported. And almost equal volume, about 4.5 million tons is exported and equal volume is consumed in the domestic market. So almost uh, 8 million tons of Basmati rice is being produced, earning 32,000 crores of foreign exchange. 95% of this is coming from IRI varieties. The, this is important in the sense that, you know, we are importing oil, oil, edible oil worth uh, 75,000 crores every year. And that import bill is partly compensated by the exporting the commodities like basmati rice. The problems that we have now, which had, we started addressing using molecular tools and technology is the problems of biotic stresses. So there are several biotic stresses in rice and the rice breeders are familiar with them. You talk of bacterial blight, you talk of blast disease, you talk of brown plant hopper and the hopper born in the field that you can see the complete field is devastated. The seed blight, the bacani, the brown spot, the false smut and whatnot. So this is a major challenge and uh, this challenge has been effectively addressed in certain cases, at least in case of blight and blast by marker assisted by cross breeding. A typical Please mute yourself. Kindly mute yourself. So a typical marker assisted by cross breeding is seen and students may be particularly interested in this is that you have a recurrent parent which has all the good characters but lacks in one or two characters which is present in the donor parent. You make a cross, F1 is crossed back to recurrent parent to recover its genome. You get BC1, F1 and then self three. And there are four steps that are involved in marker-assisted back cross breeding. The foreground selection which refers to the selection for the gene of interest. Recombinant selection is a reduction of linkage drag that the segment coming from donor parent other than the gene of interest has to be eliminated. So that is called recombinant selection. Background selection is a recovery of, a recovery of recurrent parent genome. And phenotypic selection is for target traits, yield, quality and resistance. So this is a standard practice of molecular marker assisted back cross breeding. How we do it, again, I would say this could be one uh, full lecture when I teach this in my classroom of molecular breeding. I spent three days on marker assisted back cross breeding fundamental principles. So uh, we use this uh, tool and we transferred the two genes, XA13 and XA21, XA13 on chromosome 8 and XA21 on chromosome 11 through molecular marker assisted breeding in Pusa Basmati 1, which had become highly susceptible to bacterial blight and then we developed improved Pusa Basmati 1 variety. And this improved Pusa Basmati 1 variety was highly resistant to bacterial blight and combining all the quality of uh, Pusa Basmati 1. The next variety, Pusa Basmati 1121, again it is popular in that we have combined two genes, XA13 and XA21 for resistance to bacterial leaf light. This paper came in plant science and uh, the variety Pusa Basmati 1718. Uh, which is resistant to bacterial blight. It's a near isogenic line of Pusa Basmati 1121 has been released for commercial cultivation 
if you just go to google and uh, uh, youtube and type uh, pusha basmati 1718 you will find thousands of videos which have been produced by different farmers about the merit of varieties and this social media is playing so important role in promoting varieties likewise another variety pusha basmati 6 that we had there also we combined xa 13 xa 21 to develop pusha basmati 1728 and this is the farmers field view of 1728 uh, with excellent productivity so this is the this is the slide that i was talking about the role of social media in promotion of variety you can see here 1718 1718 and uh, on each of these uh, uh short videos and these are small entrepreneurs uh seed mans, farmers they have uh, developed these videos uh, and they are so efficient you see for example when we prepare a video generally we are biased about our activity of institutes or universities that we try to cover uh, everything and the length of video exceeds to say 12 minutes 15 minutes 30 minutes and then nobody will watch it some rule is that your uh, time should be about six to seven minutes not more than that so the, these people have taken all those care and then these videos are available on youtube about the merit of varieties that helps in promoting more than what we can do from our institutions also we are working on identification of novel genes for resistance to bacterial e blight one of the genetic resource from the land race population bam 72 which was identified as resistant crossed with 1121 and disaggregated in 3 is to 1 ratio in a recessive gene fashion with one resistant tree susceptible and then we use a QTL seq approach to map this gene we have designated tentatively as XA43 the regions in which the gene is located there are a few candidate genes and we are now in the process of functional validation by uh, um, RT-PCR to see uh, which one is the candidate genes and ultimately goal is to use those candidate genes for transformation of a successful variety to see that uh, if that's the actually candidate gene. This is another major problem that you can see. This is my colleague Dr. A.K. Singh who is DDG extension. He was director IRI officiating. When we visited field, uh, you know, with him, we found number of farmers suffering from this neck blast disease, basmati rice. And neck blast is a very serious uh, uh, disease. The farmers will use for uh, its control a uh, fungicide called tricyclazole. And tricyclazole has been banned in the European Union. In the European Union, we are uh, exporting basmati rice worth 5,000 crores. And EU says that if tricyclazole residue in their rice import, uh, imported, by them is uh, 0 0.01 ppm 0 0.01 ppm is just a default limit the instrument even cannot detect at this level uh, then they will not accept consignment from india so the only way to address this problem is that we incorporate resistance to blast diseases and we started a systematic breeding program a number of genes for resistance to blast particularly pi1 pi5 beta pi5 pi9 pi2 and pib they were transferred to the genetic background of Pusha Basmati 1 and now we have several isogenic lines of Pusha Basmati 1 combining 1 gene, 2 gene, 3 gene, 4 gene, 5 gene pyramids of blast resistance this paper came in theoretical applied genetics and one of this variety and you can see here the power of molecular breeding, microsystem background breeding this is original Pusha Basmati 1, the recipient line and this is donor IRBL9W so this has got uh, a bold grain, red pericarp, chalky grains, it swells on food. All bad characters as far as quality is concerned. Now this we have to use it as donor because it contains a very important gene for blast resistance that is PI9. But when you use this as a donor parent in the F1, you will have 50% genome from donor, 50% from recurrent parent and therefore all the quality characters are distorted. And to recover that, these are the new lines which we have developed. You can see they are exactly identical to Pusha Vashmati 1 and uh, they have resistance to blast and that you can see here. This is Pusha Vashmati 1 in any farm blast nursery at Milan completely killed while the same Pusha Vashmati 1 with PI9 gene 
is surviving 100%. So uh, this is the power of single gene. And this variety, Pusa Vasmati 1637, was released for commercial cultivation with an average yield of 28 to 35 quintals per acre. Farmers are very happy with this variety. Also, our Director General, Dr. Mahapatra, visited these farmers' field to have first hand feel how the variety is performing. Uh, we use uh, two types of markers for background selection one is SSR marker, another is SNP markers. So if you use stick marker SIP chip in rice, it is available, developed by Dr. N. K. Singh, which uh, contains, uh, you know, 51,000 uh, single nucleotide polymorphism marker loci. Uh, when you compare the data from SNP chip versus SSR marker, you will find that the SNP analysis shows that there is uh, still a lot of donor segment present. But... Uh, Generally, our recommendation is that in marker assisted by class breeding, we use about uh, 65 markers providing genome wide coverage, 5 markers to 6 markers per chromosome, and that should be sufficient for background analysis. But actually, if you do analysis with a large number of markers, you'll find that what looks phenotypically uniform, like recurrent parent, it still carries a lot of donor segments. And if those donor segments have undesirable effects, then your reconstituted variety, the near isogenic lines, will never replace the original variety. And this we are realizing in many of the mass derived lines which have been developed. In rice, uh, not many of them have been able to replace the recurrent parent immediately. Either replacement is a forced replacement that you stop seed production of the original variety, then farmer has no choice, but it should happen that when both are made available, the farmer chooses the new one, not the old one. And that will only happen if the variety does not lose any essential and important character of recurrent parent. Another disease which is very important is uh, Bakani, caused by Zebra fusiparae of Anzai, which produces uh, uh, zebralic acid in the plant. And because of this, the plants grow tall and finally they dry. So you can see this field of farmer of 1121 variety which is uh, infected with Bukhane disease and the entire field looks so ugly. To control this disease again you have to use fungicides, seed treatment, seedling treatment and still it is not controlled because it is seed born and less soil born. So we initiated a mapping program and one of my students Abdul Fiyaj worked on this and uh, we did a QTL mapping identified uh, two major QTLs 1.1 1.2 which we are now required in our Basmati varieties to bring in persistence to Bakan. This slide shows uh, our work on herbicide tolerance in rice. So we had a project on mutagenesis in, 11, uh, in, in uh, N22, and the objective of this uh, uh, project was to develop a large number of mutations for thinning exercise, and in the process, one mutation was identified at uh, TNAU, Tamil Nadu Agricultural University by Dr. Robin, uh, which was tolerant to herbicide immediate And uh, this, uh, um, you know, my memory goes back to three years back uh, when we organized the rice workshop at Assam Agricultural University, Turhat, when Robin was making his presentation in the auditorium and he had a uh, brain hemorrhage he fell while he was presenting. Uh, he was admitted in Guwahati for a couple of days, uh, but uh, we could not uh, save him. What a great scientist and uh, great uh, researchers. Uh, I made a tribute to Robin in order to recognize his contributions. This uh, mutant can be registered with National Bureau of Plant Genetic Resources. Uh, this mutant has been named as uh, Robin. So we used the uh, uh, Robin mutant uh, in the background of N22 and crossed with our Basmati varieties 1509-1121 and now we have developed near isogenic lines of 1509. So you can see here 1509 carrying a mutant allele of ALS gene, acetolactate synthase. And this plot that you see there is nothing here. This plot was grown with original 1509 and after 20 days of transplanting when we sprayed herbicide, the 1509 is completely killed, but nothing happens to uh, near isogenic lines of 1509. Everything is perfectly fine. 
So they provide high degree of resistance and now we have entered these lines into the coordinated trials and hopefully we will have them released soon. If that happens, then we will be able to push the uh, you know, direct seeded rice in a big way. Another area that we are working in uh, is uh, dwarf, uh, you know, these uh, uh, sort grain aromatic rices. One of the sort grain aromatic rices from Eastern UP is uh, Kala Namak, like you have Kala Joha in Assam. So, uh, Kala Namak is a traditional tall sort grain aromatic land race from Eastern UP, which is protected with geographical indication. But again, it is tall, it is prone to lodging. And one of my students uh, uh, worked on this. Buneswari, understanding the basis and uh, uh, using this, uh, we, we made it dwarf actually by crossing with a mutant of Bindli, again a short grain aromatic rice and now you can see this Kala Namak has got the height of uh, less than our loin, it is hardly 80 centimeters against uh, traditional Kala Namak which is up to my shoulder. So these dwarf ones, they are highly productive, they are responsive to uh, fertilizer management and their yield is very good quality, same as traditional Kalanamak. I am trying to evaluate them in large area in eastern Uttar Pradesh. And this is Director of Agriculture of Eastern UP who came to Delhi to see this plot. And once released, this will bring again a revolution of the kind that Bashmati has brought in uh, in the northwestern India. So, uh, uh, some fundamental principles when we do molecular breeding, what are the constraints and the uh, prospects? The population size and throughput of genotyping. This is one. Most of our genotyping in our laboratory is limited to microsatellite genotyping on gel based approach. And with that, we cannot do molecular breeding. All university institutions have to increase their capacity. Not necessarily we have to create infrastructure, but now there are good number of outsourcing facilities available. National, uh, National Institute of Plant Genome Research, NIPGR has been funded by DBT to create a massive facility for genotyping where genotyping can then can be done at a cheaper cost. Uh, another point that I feel is markers instead backcross breeding uh, is a restrictive approach. Restrictive approach in the sense that it can improve Ranjit, it can improve Bahadur for resistance to uh, say uh, flooding tolerance and bring uh, Ranjit sub one and Bahadur sub one. But it cannot create a new Ranjit and new Bahadur. If new Ranjit, new Bahadur have to be created. They cannot be created by backcross breeding approach. So uh, many times uh, we are uh, kind of blinded by the power of new technologies and our focus shift to the technology based approach only. And therefore the regular breeding program suffers. We kindly have in each breeding program the head plant breeding, and the vice chancellor, Dr. Sarma, everybody have a judicious balance between the traditional approach of creating variation and the marker-assisted backcross breeding for improving effective genotypes. And that's where one has to embrace the technologies like genomic selection, marker-assisted recurrence selection, or conventional approach that we are following that should be followed. Uh, because uh, the conversion of conventional plant breeder into molecular breeder will somewhere be a, a, a concern, like we have to have people in both areas working. Uh, this needs to, uh, you know, uh, marker system recurrent selection, genomic selection for enhancing genetic gain, speed breeding is required, regional genotyping center. I say, for example, there can be one genotyping center in northeastern region, efficient breeding management system, digitization of breeding information is very, very important. This is one problem. If you recall, the most uh, successful breeder uh, of your university who created Ranjit, who created Bahadur, for example, uh, where is the field notebook of those breeders? Do we maintain a record? When they made cross, which were the parents, how they made observations, those field notebooks must be lost with the people retirement. There is no way we can maintain and This has not been in our system. It is very important to adopt a breeding management system where we digitize the information in plant breeding program. So irrespective of whether the person is there or not, you know what has been done in past or how many crosses have already been attempted. And therefore you try to avoid them, make new crosses and things of that kind. So this is extremely important. 
I think uh, with this, I uh, I, I uh, complete the rice portion that uh, I had uh, committed to. But if you permit me, uh, the title of this particular training program is focused on uh, nutritional security and improvement. So a few slides I have added on that aspect also. If you permit me, I'll quickly go through if there is time. Otherwise, I'll stop here. Yes, yes, sir. Okay. Please, please so go ahead. Sorry. We know that the malnutrition is a major problem which afflicts more than 2 billion people uh, worldwide. Uh, just a minute. Uh, So, uh, afflicts 2 billion people worldwide. And uh, if you look at the severity of uh, hidden hunger, hidden hunger we describe as the hunger that happens because of nutrition. Uh, it can be mild, moderate, severe, alarming, high. Uh, and uh, India is suffering in major deficiency with respect to protein, iron, zinc, and uh, the, it is in alarming high category. So this is a very important uh, thing that we must notice and the sustainable development goal, particularly the goal number two, which is zero hunger goal has to address and make it sure that we become uh, hunger free. And uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, the 17 sustainable develop development goals described out of which the goal number two is hunger and uh, nutrition. And uh, these are uh, uh, addressing the extreme poverty, hunger and malnutrition, 12 out of 17 goals. Uh, they are uh, indicators related to uh, nutrition given here. And if you look at the loss in GDP due to malnutrition, in India it is estimated to be 12 billion. This is of course estimates of economists. Uh, that means if a person is healthy, is not suffering from nutritional hunger, is not suffering from any kind of anemia and so on. His productivity is very high. If you take a diseased person, even if he comes to office, he will not be able to work to his full potential. So uh, that loss is about uh, $12 billion. Of course, it is a different matter that we have large number of youth who are also uh, unemployed. So that, that's another uh, dilemma, but at the same time, uh, this this problem is there, and therefore we need to uh, work on uh, having addressing these problems. And this problem can be addressed by several approaches. One of them is uh, biofortification. So when we say biofortification, biofortification means enhancing the genetic capability of plant to uptake micronutrients from the soil and accumulate in grain. This is what is called biofortification. Otherwise, you can have fortification, and fortification can be artificial uh, mixing of uh, nutrients into the grain. For example, there are ultra rice uh, available. And ultra rice is that you take uh, broken rice, make a flour, uh, then mix nutrition, uh, iron, zinc, and knead it, and then you again subject it to extrusion technology. And from extrusion technology, you can create imprinted grains like if you want to mix it in jaya you can print the grain upside jaya from the uh, need the floor if you want to make it uh, 1121 like you can print the grain which are long so uh, and then you can mix that uh, ultra rice into certain proportions uh, for example there can be 80 percent normal rice and 20 percent ultra rice of same shape so the consumer would not know, but then consumer is benefited by the nutrition. But that is fortification, that is not biofortification. Biofortification uh, uh, has a great advantage because in case of biofortification, the nutrition becomes the part of the food matrix. It is not added from outside and its bioavailability is very high. A number of biofortified varieties of rice have been released and developed, which are listed here. Then uh, another area that we have been working for long, of course, uh, Bangladesh has come out with some uh, final stage material. Our goal was to combine uh, pro-vitamin A uh, into uh, beta-carotene into Sorna. So this is Sorna original. You all know about Sorna. 
and we transfer the gene for pro vitamin A in sorna background. And this golden sorna, you can see on polishing, it looks like gold. It's golder than gold. This has got over 25 microgram of portal carotenoid. And, but since this is a transgenic material, it could not be pushed uh, further. But when you do this kind of research, there are some lessons to learn. And one lesson that we learned from this particular work was that when this trans, you see, when, when we transferred the transgene into Sorna background, we found that when the gene transgene became in homozygous condition, these Sorna plants, they became dwarf. They had very reduced panicle size. And uh, panicle exertion was very poor. And uh, there was loss of agronomy character. This is, you see, you can see this is Sorna homozygous for the transgene. This is Sorna hemizygous for the transgene. And this is original Sorna. So the panicle size of hemizygous and original Sorna is same, but our homozygous lines is very dark. That means you cannot deploy this technology because of poor agronomy. We were puzzled why this is happening. Sorna 5 PhD student Harita worked on this. And she found that the transgene was inserted in the exon 1 of a gene OX1, which is responsible for all gene synthesis. Because of insertion uh, of this, the exon 1 was disrupted, oxygen production was brought down, and therefore these plants had reduced growth. So when you do these kinds of work, you have to make it sure that the transgene is not inserted in the functional gene native genes, is not silencing. If that happens, then you will not be able to push this kind of transgenic material. Likewise, uh, we are working uh, on quality protein maize. My colleague, Kureo Shiroz Hussain, is working extensively, and he has been able to develop the quality protein lines of maize with 3 to 4% uh, of, uh, you know, lysine and tryptophan from 0.8 to 1%, as against original 1.5 to 0.3% of tryptophan in normal maize. And many of the hybrid varieties have been created. It is important how we push this material in, uh, for the uh, general uses. Another gene uh, for uh, uh, quality protein maize is OPEC-16. The earlier one was OPEC-2. So this gene also has been characterized. And when we combine OPEC-2 with OPEC-16, the quality is still improved further. Lysine and tryptophan content. So this is a HM4 hybrid, PUSA HM4, which was released by CVRC in 2017. And uh, another area that we are working is uh, improving the pro-vitamin A content in maize, that is beta carotene, like we have done in case of golden rice. So the golden rice pro-vitamin gene comes from maize one. And maize has got a natural gene, CRTRB1. And if we have a favorable allele at this locus, CRTRB1, then the pro vitamin A content is high. This hybrid PUSA VV QPM9, this is for hill region uh, and is doing very well. It has been released by CVRC for Northeastern Hill Zone and Plain Zone. Uh, also, we have done some studies on bioavailability of pro vitamin A using in vitro model, and uh, there has been, uh, you know, PUSA PV163, uh, it, it has 52%. And this has effectivity of 64%. So there are varietal differences in terms of bioavailability that also has to be looked into. Uh, this we have tried on one of the uh, uh, chicken breed that is called Banraja. And the feed conversion efficiency in bio-45 material is much higher. You can also see the effect of pro-vitamin A on the uh, color of uh, chicken legs. is quite yellow here and the egg yolk color. Uh, that is reflected in the beta carotene enhanced value. So uh, it is like if you use quality protein maize as a feed and feed the poultry on QPM maize versus non-QPM maize, then in the product, in terms of eggs and also in terms of chicken legs, you can find a clear difference uh, of accumulation of beta carotene, making it rich. So we are also working on uh, alternative pathways combining a gene for uh, you know CRT RB1 and there is another lycopene is a common substrate on which LCYB acts and LCYE acts. LCYE if it acts it goes to lutein production. Lutein is not required uh, for beta carotene. So if we block the gene here for example then this conversion will be rooted to this and you increase further the level of beta carotene. So alpha-carotene is not uh, uh, the precursor for 
pro-vitamin A in human system. When we consume beta-carotene, it is converted into vitamin A. So that's where we are trying to improve it by bringing two different uh, genetic systems. In wheat, a number of varieties have been released by different institutions. I want to touch upon that. And the WB02 from Indian Institute of Wheat and Barley Research, HPBW01 from Harvest Plus, and Pusa Uzala, this is from our IRI, Regional Station Indoor. Oh, these varieties have got, uh, you know, the baseline of 28 to 32 ppm, target level is 45 ppm for iron and zinc and protein content. So, likewise, for millet, it has been made mandatory that uh, a variety having, uh, you know, less than 45 ppm of iron and less than 30 ppm of zinc shall not be released for commercial cultivation and those targets are being followed, many varieties have been released. Uh, the only problem, uh, also they have been subjected to bioavailability studies and uh, 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 the National Institute of Nutrition, after evaluating 20 biofortified wheat lines, revealed two genotypes with 20% bioavailability of iron uh, when it is 40 feet in content. So the problem with the biofortified material, as it was also mentioned by, I think, uh, Honorable Dean, that 70 plus varieties which are biofortified have been released and two publications have been brought out by the council by Dr. D.K. Adov. The major problem we have been discussing at different forum is how to promote these biofortified varieties. Because when farmers go with biofortified varieties in Monday, he doesn't get any price difference. So why he should grow it? Even if they are at par with yield, a variety for which farmer is very sure would like to promote. So we have been uh, pursuing this particular line that the price of uh, uh, a particular commodity like rice, wheat and uh, other cereals should not merely be fixed based on the, uh, the MSP which is only based on cost of uh, cultivation and the uh, what is called uh, the price 1.5 times as Dr. Swaminathan committee says. But if we fix the price based on the nutrition, that will give the added value. If you take a normal formula variety which has got 30 ppm iron and a biofortified formula variety which has got 60 ppm iron, and if you calculate it from the point of view that if you take a capsule or tablet, those who are taking uh, it in the morning for iron or for uh, zinc COVID for zinc, uh, one tablet costs around 6 rupees and that 6 rupees provides you uh, certain uh, content of uh, zinc. Now, if the same thing is converted when it is coming from biofortified varieties, then because of additional zinc and iron that is provided in biofortified varieties over and above the base level of non-biofortified varieties, these should receive at least 400 rupees extra uh, minimum support price. So if a pearl millet is selling for normal pearl millet for 1800 rupees a quintal, the biofortified pearl millet should be 2400 rupees a quintal. And if that is done, the farmers will be encouraged to grow that. Some of those policy interventions have to be brought in because we don't mind paying an eating capsule. But uh, at the same time, we have to be aware of the education about nutrition the, the one of the major problems in the country is uh, educational illiteracy. Even the most literate people are most illiterate about the nutrition. How much they should take, how much calorie is required, how much we are taking. Uh, knowing that this is not good, that is something that has to be really uh, taken seriously. The malnutrition and malnutrition, two things I talk about. One is M-A-L, uh, N-U-T-R-I-T-I-O-N, another is M-A-L-L. So this M-A-L-L malnutrition is a major problem now in India. So, uh, and that comes from the mall culture. You go to malls, uh, you know, uh, shopping malls, where you have pizza, burger, and uh, so many other things. And then that brings you a kind of malnutrition, which is not really you are nutritionally hungry, but sometimes you have uh, enough of kilocalorie, more than what is required, and also you have other nutrition more than what is required, particularly carbohydrate is going very high. So those also have to be brought in in terms of education on 
uh, nutrition literacy is very very important uh, earlier when we were child in villages diet used to be balanced because it was it was based on seasonal availability uh, so there are certain seasons you take a particular stuff in certain season winters you get certain steps and only one of those those steps are available so you get used to you get a lot of uh, diversity in food but in cities that diversity is completely uh, lost because everything is available all the time and therefore you prefer to take what is uh, what you uh, like only so that that leads to a uh, lot of uh, problem so i think uh, all these aspects have to be taken into account i would like to uh, thank all my colleagues uh, for their wonderful contribution in the work that i have presented before you and i am thankful to the honorable vice chancellor dr sharma and the organizer of this uh, particular uh, webinar for giving me this opportunity to present our work and share our experiences with you thank you very much yes sir yes, yes. yeah i am just i'm sharing my screen and then we can have uh, yes dear no, participants uh, dear students and researchers we may have lot many you know uh, queries on the presentation first uh, let them give some time so very good question neha so uh, sdn1 and sdn2 is about uh, a gene that is already present in the plant okay for example if i say you have a traditional tall variety of kala joha okay and uh, you know that the dwarfing is brought about by dg ugen the gene dg ugen is well characterized which particular change in nucleotide makes it dwarf is also known so if you have a wild type allele of sdn1 in kala joha you can alter the wild type allele of kala joha by just altering that single nucleotide so it is so precise that you are not bringing any gene from outside you are not bringing any protein from outside it is native protein only if the uh, uh, morph is changing and therefore in that case there is no need for uh, you know regulations in sdn2 you have a situation of allele replacement so the targeted allele replacement is done in that case also the protein or gene is not coming from outside from any alien sources and therefore these two have been proposed to be kept out of they are just like normal mutation when you create mutagenesis either radiation or through ems induced mutagenesis you alter a native gene and so what you do in this case also so that's why they are proposed to be kept out of uh, this so that has been one of the major attempt that uh, unless we have the yield at par the farmers are not going to pick up them now the new generation biofortified maize hybrids which have been released uh, they are at par with the original version so the yield is as good as this one however in case of wheat some of the varieties that have been released they are not as high yielding as the best variety the government ultimately wants us to incorporate the 
quality traits in nutrition into high yielding background and that will be possible once you identify the key determinants of the uh, quality traits and go for molecular uh, breeding. So uh, yes, you are right when we increase the protein content, there is some decline in yield, but uh, ultimately uh, the goal would be to have them at par in yield. That will be possible with better understanding of uh, the genetic control of quality traits and nutrition. Well, this is a very uh, ticklish question and I will answer it in a very straightforward manner. Ticklish in the sense that uh, Basmati is protected under geographical indication. And therefore, Basmati cannot be cultivated outside GI area. There are seven states which have been identified as GI states for Basmati rice and those are Jammu and Kashmir, Himachal Pradesh, Punjab, Haryana, uh, Delhi, 27 districts of Western Uttar Pradesh and Uttarakhand. So beyond this, if it is grown, the produce thereof will not be called as Basmati. There cannot be a Basmati breeding program uh, for South India or for any region other than this GI area. You can produce, you can produce, you can uh, grow it, uh, but you cannot market it as Basmati. Is there any chance of getting homozygous donor allele in BC1 F1? No, it is not there, but sometimes people do get it and that would depend upon in back crossing if you have used your donor as female parent, for example, or uh, you see the point is that uh, some selfing can happen if there is some mismatch, otherwise theoretically it is not possible. One has to really look into how uh, the crossing has been done. The donor really uh, cannot be in homozygous condition. Uh, and the, the recipient allele can come in a homogeneous condition, but not the donor. So these are of course evaluated and only after they meet the minimum standards of quality trace that they are uh, released. So biofortified means basically you are adding, you know, iron in case of uh, rice, iron is very less. It is only concentrated in the pericarp layer, but zinc uh, lines are there and uh, they are at par with the uh, best of the cooking lines. HM4 is HM4 actually initially was bred as a grain purpose hybrid only, but it has been found as good uh, for baby corn purpose also. We have converted HM4 into biofortified uh, lysine tryptophan rich version. Uh, but uh, you have to see that uh, in case of baby corn, you are consuming commercially what you are consuming is unpollinated, unfertilized. Uh, cow. Okay, so uh, since there is no expression of grain there, you cannot increase, uh, uh, you know, the nutrition because it is just it is unwise ones. So, but in the grain purpose which you are using, then of course it is uh, you will get the increased nutrition. <laughs> Yeah, sir. I have no problem. It depends on you. There is. I can also see some questions. Yeah, please. Yeah, please. You go and ask. What is the importance of precision plant breeding using genome editing? Uh, the precision plant breeding, as I said, that uh, uh, you know, for transferring a gene into a recurrent parent through backcross breeding, you are bringing a lot of uh, uh, undesirable donor segments. But in case of genome editing, if you understand gene, if you know the gene and its location, 
you can just make a specific change without bringing donor segment undesirable donor segment which takes lot of time to eliminate it by back cross breeding so that's the uh, precision in the genome editing tool you can do a selective uh, targeted alteration without bringing the alien uh, and the donor segment So seed certification process is uh, same. Of course, we have been emphasizing that you know there is a requirement for near isogenic lines that we develop that they should have difference in at least two morphological character from recurrent parents, so that. when the certification team is going on the field they should be able to identify that this is a variety which is a improved version and not the old version and this job can also be done by molecular markers because in improved pusala sativan we have incorporated genes for bacterial blight so if we can take a small leaf sample from that do pcr and then easily you can know but in that case your certification agencies have to be equipped with molecular lab so that they can visit bring this leaf sample Uh, and immediately do PCR and know that this is the uh, improved variety with its sweet genes, and that can be accepted. That's the that's that's the very reason why we say that there is no regulation required. You cannot differentiate. you cannot differentiate a product developed through conventional breeding like mutagenesis versus the one developed through genome editing they cannot be differentiated yeah yeah please sdn3 shall be regulated uh, as uh, as the transgenics as the transgenic there no difference between them only difference is that in case of transgenics a uh, normal procedure you do not know where the transgene is going which chromosome it is going to settle that you don't know but in case of sdn3 you can decide the location of transgene where you want to integrate and precisely at that location you can do that integration So first of all I would like to express my heartfelt thanks to Dr. A.K. Singh for a very detailed and very informative uh, address to the participants and I'm also at the same time very happy that our participants uh, reacted equally to know some of the things from a learned person other than like uh, Dr. A.K. Singh and I think uh, we can have much more close collaboration with IRI with a some medical university straightly because uh, you know in case of uh, rice land races already we have developed uh, one one big project where dr kuldeep is also there last time probably dr singh sahab you probably recall our association during yeah. last the pgr meeting yeah. so likewise probably we can have a sort of direct collaboration with iri and some medical university Uh, for your information, sir, we have already accommodated uh, accommodated one student from uh, IRI to, you know, complete his uh, research uh, activities in Assam University because of this pandemic situation. Thank and uh, we will we'll look look forward uh, to have direct uh, collaboration with IRI from Assam University. And thank you from Assam Medical Center University once more. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure uh, that I got associated with this group, and we will keep this uh, our dialogue. Uh,
continue in future also. And as you rightly said, that there is a good possibility. You know, DBT comes out with several proposal in the uh, training, Northeast training schemes, where uh, mostly it is based on individual one-to-one -one person contact. But uh, uh, and many uh, such projects projects are uh, being done uh, between IRI and uh, Northeastern region. Uh, but we can have a, a, a joint proposal for all proper put together, maybe a mega project under this particular component if possible. We can think on that and that will be really good. Work together there. Thank you. Thank you Thank so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So permit me to leave now as I have another meeting at 12 30. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, we thank you, sir. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Also, also, we thank the NAHEP for sponsoring this program and uh, thank you all the per on, uh, <coughs> respected participants, the Vice Chancellor, the Dean Faculty of Agriculture, Director of Extension Education, the distinguished scientists, teachers and uh, students uh, and Active, very actively they have participated in this webinar and we look forward to the same sort of participation in the following uh, six uh, four five more webinars uh, this afternoon at 3 p.m today then tomorrow at 11 day after and then the up to saturday at 11 o'clock every day thank you very much thank you dr uh, raman sharma uh, for actively very well organizing this webinar. Thank you very much.